Good evening to you all, and I've got to thank those of you that braved the, the wet, coldy weather, which we, we really need outside to join us in the chapel. It's great that we managed under the circumstances to get a live audience um, and get Dean in town. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce, introduce Dean um, as our speaker for tonight. So just a bit of background about him. Originally, he comes from Somerset in England. He is a key, keynote speaker, public speaker, and best-selling author. He was the first in his family to attend university and has therefore, uh, thereafter lectured at universities in South Africa, the UK, Ireland, and Australia. Amongst this, he has also published widely on the areas of history and politics of sports and society throughout the British Empire, but most notably in South Africa. Amongst his academic accolades include his BSc in Honours, um, a Master's in Sports Science from Stellenbosch University, and ultimately his PhD in Sports History and socio uh, Sociology. Through all of his travels, his longest association with any one country has been South Africa, where, while conducting his research for his Master's degree at Stellenbosch, he visited Mike Fontaine. A fascination for the history of this region led to the completion of his PhD and consequently the publishing of his book, Empire, War and Cricket in South Africa. Dean attributes much of his success to the cultures and people he has been exposed to during his various academic posts around the world. South Africans in particular have taught him the power of determination. He is largely influenced by one of our greatest statesmen, a statesman of our time, obviously Mr. Nelson Mandela. Mr. Mandela saw the value of sport in uniting people and healing the past. Dean sees him as an incredible visionary who understood the power of humility. Dean seeks to apply the similar principles in his work and believes that the roles of teacher and writer are privileged positions to hold in any society. Wherever Dean may go, his ties with South Africa and his bond with the rich sporting culture, past and present, run deep and will continue to draw him back to South Africa and its people. We were lucky enough that Dean um, presented an assembly to our pupils this morning and opened up this conversation. So I now hand over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kerry. And uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming along. And I uh, don't know about you, isn't it lovely to be in a room with real people? Um, as, as, as Curry said, we, this morning we did a, an assembly and it was all online. I was actually based in Craddock and that is more stressful for a speaker to do some, something online than to stand in front of a thousand people. But first of all, I'd like to thank Kerry for an incredible work in making this happen. We've got people watching us now li via live stream and thank you so much, as I said, for braving this weather, which is more like England than it is South Africa out there today. Um, but it is so important that we start to, start to you know, get our lives back in order and one of those things is to experience live events again. I'm a, I'm a public speaker as well as a teacher and for the last well 18 months or so my work has been outlawed. I can't actually be in a room with people so this is fantastic to have this event today. Now those of you that have heard me speak before, I know some of the people from the, the Historical Society are here, will know that I'm quite well known for writing that book on Mikey Fontaine. Well tonight I'm going to be going um, rather similar, similar kind of vein, but I'm going to be broadening out this topic. When I said to Kerry, what would you like me to talk to the students and the staff about, she said, I quite fancy this idea of how sport shaped the world. And what that is, it's based upon my um, studies over the past 20 years and, the, and some of the lessons I've given at university, because I've worked in sports universities all around the world. But here in South Africa, as Curry said, this is exactly where I want to be. And we've moved back here, um, and we're excited to be back in South Africa. So I hope you enjoyed tonight's uh, presentation. For those of you that know me, um, it, you, you understand my passion for this country. But for those of you that don't, it sounds like I've just got off the plane, doesn't it? I've still got that incredible West Country accent, by the way. Uh, no, ma no matter where I've been, in Australia, in America, in Northern Ireland, strong accents, this accent sticks with me. Um, but people often ask me when I'm back in the UK, why do you spend so much time in South Africa? Why do you study sport there? And I, I've I had to explain, and a lot of people don't understand this complex country of ours. So I, often at the start of my talks, I put up one image, and this image explains everything to people. That's why I spend time in South Africa. It's not a bad place to hang out, is it? I mean, to me, this is probably the greatest sports stadium in the world. You'll know.
magnificent setting to play sport. I mean, just look at it. You've got the mountain, you've got a wonderful stadium, but that white building at the back, that's uh, the Castle Brewery. I've even got a beer on tap. I mean, what more did I need to study cricket here in South Africa? And that led me to write a master's degree and a PhD, which led to the book. So it's not just about cricket. So thank you for coming out today if you're not a particular cricket fan or sports fan, because today we're going to be talking about how sport is part of the society in which we live today, an important part, how society reflects sport and how sport reflects society. And that's what we're going to be looking at. Now, for me, it's all about this place in terms of creating a reputation. And it's, this is Mikey's Fontaine. Has anybody never been to Mikey's Fontaine or not heard of it? You've all heard of it though, haven't you? I've probably put more people in the beds of that hotel than anyone alive, that's for sure. I've, uh, for the last five years or so, can you believe that book came out in 2015? We've sold over 12,000 copies, by the way, because people love the history of that place, but it's about more. This quirky old hotel, which is in the middle of the Karoo, well, about two and a half hours from Cape Town, really has a, a magnificent history. So when I was at Stellenbosch University, that's right, with this accent, I was at that Afrikaans University in the mid, sort of mid 90s, um, in the early 2000s. People used to say to me, why don't you go to Mikey's Fontaine? And, and one weekend I did, I started to dig a little bit deeper as a man who was fascinated with history. And then I realized that nobody had ever written its story. So that was going to be my destiny. But it also leads me to give talks like this to you guys. So I'm forever thankful for that place, Mikey's Fontaine. Now, if any of you have ever written a book or anything, can put anything, whether it's a song, a poem, and put it into the public sphere, you, I'm sure you still get a buzz when people enjoy it. So every, I must admit I do this. Every time I go past an exclusive book, I still check if it's on the shelves. And it is still there, which is fantastic. Perhaps it's not selling very well. I hadn't thought of that. But here we have a copy of Empire, War and Cricket in the exclusive books at the waterfront. But for me... It's about the fact that I can actually contribute something to this wonderful South African history. Now, we're talking about moving forward. Some of you, are, I'm sure, realize that I've got another book coming out soon. It's not going to be another Empire War and Cricket, but that is my love of the Eastern Cape, just in that cover. There's something about this province, the fact that I'm standing here in Makanda giving this talk, I really do, I really have fallen in love with this province. And as we've traveled around, I've been fortunate enough to do so. I've been taking pictures and right, collecting stories. So currently in production is a book called Frontierland because we are in the frontier. We still feel like that, I think, in Makanda today, don't we? But that book will be coming out soon. So I hope you'll enjoy it when it does come out. So enough of the plug because we are in a place of great history. Now, we're not, I'm not going to give you a talk about the... the, the the, the town or city that you know better than me, I'm sure. But you certainly recognize that scene, don't you? That's Church Square in the 1950s. And people tell me when I often put things up on Facebook, they tell me things that I didn't know. We we're aware of the town hall and of course the cathedral. But there we have on the, uh, on the corner, Bay's shop, which was, I believe, burnt down. It was, it's now the Lewis's store. And would you believe only this morning I met the architect that was actually behind rebuilding that magnificent building in, in in the early 2000s after it burnt down. So I'm learning things as I go along. For me, Grahamstown has such, and I will call it Grahamstown from time to time if you don't mind, because it is the historical context. It has so much significance in terms of the history of this country and in sport, as I will explain. Now, when I walk around a bookshop, as I'm sure a lot of you do, I look at the titles. Now, that title struck me. Will South Africa be okay? It's a question that we always ask ourselves, don't we? I mean, every, every month there seems to be some kind of crisis, but will South Africa be okay? I believe it will be because of the people. And it's the people I found, I found my, my tribe when I arrived here in the mid-90s. I feel more connected to South Africans than I do to, to probably people in my home country. And often people back in the United Kingdom will say, Dean, what about the corruption? What about the dodgy politics? And I say, well, we've got our own problems there as well, you know. I'm not going to keep him up on the screen too long, by the way. It's a face I don't particularly care looking at. 
but we, it's all relevant, you see. We all have our own issues in the, in, our, in the country. So it's a case of taking the good and the bad. And I believe if we have educational establishments like here at Kingswood in this wonderful, wonderful city, and we've got Rhodes University and, of course, the schools down the road, I believe there's a future for this country because this, it really is about the youth of this country. And this morning I was speaking to the students about having a sense of perspective about the kind of things they're going through at the moment. And I thought that was an important message. So we talked, didn't we, about comparing what was happening, what's happening now in terms of COVID and what happened 100 years ago in terms of the Spanish flu. And boy, were they a lot worse off than we are today. So I think that's what history does. It gives us a sense of perspective. It gives us a sense of where we are now and perhaps where we're going in the future. And perhaps lets us understand where characters like this fit into our, into our um, society. Now, I'm not going to promote beer here in a, in, a, in a college, but this was the moment, you're probably wondering, what, who and what I was doing um, back in November 2019 when the Springboks played the English in the final. Well, that picture will let you know who I was supporting that day. And it was an awkward moment, by the way, because I was surrounded by a lot of English. I was surrounded by not only people in that bar where I watched it, but my best friend is a big rugby fan. He's a PE teacher, and you know they're patriotic, a physical education teacher. He's actually a rugby coach as well. We didn't speak for two days after he found out I was a Springbok supporter. But I got up that morning, and there was only one team I was going to support. And that taught me this is where my roots are because we all know how important sport is in this country. And perhaps again in 2019, we needed another lift. And where did it come from? It came from winning a rugby match. And if anybody ever questions how sport is important in society, certainly here in South Africa, moments like that tell us everything. Now, I've got a few videos I want you to see. Now, one of the things I'm proud, proud about is, is not necessarily writing a book or talking about sport. It's the connection I have with people through sport. And I think this video will tell us everything. If you can play this, thank you. Bring glamour every night. As do you. <laughs> and more back slapping. Now then, you may remember we told you recently about a man called Dean Allen who's established links with a township in South Africa. Their football team was, un was enthusiastic but couldn't play in their local league because they had no equipment. Mm. Well, Dean is a keen Bristol City fan and their kit man Roger Barton sorted him out with shirts, socks and shorts. That's right, and then he took them to Mikey's Fontaine, which is near Cape Town, and he's just returned with this film of his trip. They look very much the part, just like any other team lining up for the cameras, but this is the first time these players have ever had their own complete kit. They come from here, Mikey's Fontaine, and this is what the tourists see when they come to this beautiful outpost of empire. A highlight stop for the blue train taking the rich across the country. but they see only one half of the picture. This is the real Mikey's Fontaine, the other side of the tracks. A growing community of over 300 people, most living near the poverty line. Their passion football, their facilities basic. Every evening they turn out to play, practice or watch. I was delighted to present the children of the primary school with their kit. Oh, that's very beautiful, man. i never seen a set in South Africa so like that, as white as that. So I think the kids really appreciate what a Bustle City has done for them. They've never been played uh, in any of these sets before. They haven't got a regular uh, soccer set. I think that is very good for Bristol City to sponsor us with that, with that uh, jerseys. I think the, kid is, the kids is very proud of it. The senior team seemed pretty pleased too. Um, our people of the soccer players are very happy with the, with the new t-shirts and playing in the new kit. With opposition like this around, you need all the help you can get. The Hawk are not confined to rugby. Mikey's Fontaine prefer to gather for the Lord's Prayer. They played three matches while I was there. They won the lot. First goal, Mikey's Fontaine, one nil. Thanks to Bristol City, they can now play in the local league for the first time. Maybe one day one of the Mikey's Fontaine players will pull on a Bristol City shirt at Ashton Gate. Dean Allen for PBC Points West in Mikey's Fontaine, South Africa. Yeah. <laughs> oh, great. 
uh, finally, you Uh, finally, you well, that, that video really tells you my connection with Mikey Fontaine, but the most important thing is the power of sport, and that really does tell us all. So would you believe that uh, those guys wearing the, the shirts of Bristol City, you didn't think you were going to meet one a, a supporter of that team tonight, did you? They never lost for three years wearing those shirts, whereas the real team, we're lucky if we go three games without losing, that's for sure. So but it just reminded me what sport means in this, in this um, country. Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take you on a journey through the ages, which is a difficult thing to do in 45 minutes or so. But I'm just going to show you how sport and society are linked, and that's certainly uh, a case here in South Africa. So, understand it's linked to society. Now, I don't want to give you lots of academic sort of definitions here, but John Horn in '99 would say to clarify the difference and older. Sorry, the differences between older and modern forms of sport is necessary to understand the difference in, in the, the actual societies in which they were created. So in other words, if society is violent or if society is fair, sports tends to reflect that. And that's what I want you to keep in mind because we're going to go right back to the start here. For me, sport is about understanding this concept of what modern sport is. So here at Kingswood College, of course, the, the students will enjoy, you know, rugby, hockey, netball, those kind of sports. But they are modern sports. What came before that? Of course, people have always been active. They've always had forms of recreation. So coming from a university background, academics are very good at labeling these things. So we're going to deal with modern sport today. But what came before it? Well, Malcolmson suggested that there was this thing called popular recreation. Well, maybe we'll use that. Uh, Gutman said medieval sports came before modern sport. I tend to prefer this one, though, folk sport. You've probably heard of that. Now, what is the difference between modern sport and folk sport? Well, quite a lot. Now, if we think about our first sporting arenas, I'm sure some of you would come up with that. I mean, that's the, the Colosseum in Rome you recognize. But what is it? It's actually an early arena or sports venue. That is a Roman stadium as such. So what are the differences between that and here, Wembley Stadium? Well, very few differences, actually. You know, there, there was a spectacle in, in, uh, in the arena. Spectators were kept apart. In fact, the richer spectators had a better view. Of course, Caesar and the, and the likes would pay more or certainly would have a better view than the peasants up in the gods. And there was a certain element of... of of, of course, entertainment. The nature of the sport may have changed, but it was all linked to society. But if you think about it, where does this modern concept of sport come from? Well, I'm just going to quickly now, which is awful history with a history master in here, but I, I'm going to ask him to forgive me. I'm going to run through a little timeline and try to group sports development, as it were. Well, first of all, if we can go back to 1200 BC, we had the first Olympics. Now, the first Olympics were actually, when I talk about the first Olympics, I'll explain that in a minute, but the ancient Olympic Games were held in Greece. So the Greek civilization, and I call that, and I use that word carefully, but the Greek civilization were very developed, and one of the things they did were they, they actually put sport and athleticism on a pedestal. Now, fast forward to 1896 when the modern Olympic Games were founded, that is what the modern Olympic Games were based upon, and I'll explain why that came about. We know that the Roman Games, now, how they were so specific within that particular band, but historians have argued this, but roughly from 200 BC to 500 AD, we had the Roman Empire in operation. Now, a lot of people think of the Roman Games as the gladiatorial games, very bloodthirsty. Not necessarily throughout its history though. That was only in the later, later sort of decades of the Roman Empire. Almost as the Roman Empire was starting to go downhill, they look for this kind of sensational form of entertainment. But like the Greek games, the Romans actually exalted the athleticism, the skilled warrior or the skilled runner or the athlete. So they were very similar, but both the Greek games and the Roman games had one thing in common. They represented an organized civilization. And that's where that link to society comes from. So this is what we normally think about. If you talk about the Roman Empire, you think about, you know, the film Gladiator, you think about, well, it, it did happen. 
It did, but as I say, in the later, later decades of the Roman Empire. So Russell Crowe would have made a far less entertaining movie if he'd have looked at the Roman games in the earlier decades of that, of, that, of that empire. But this is, of course, what makes it famous. So regardless of the actual spectacle, just think about what was happening. It was an early film, form of sport, and it was also an important part of that society. So maybe not on a Saturday as such, but certainly on certain festivals, this was taking place, and it was an important part of the Roman calendar. So if we come forward then, we've got what we call folk sports. So roughly speaking, we know that within Britain, for example, from the year 1000 to 1800 AD, we had these folk sports that took place before urbanization took place. Now here again, I'm linking sport to society, and I do apologize for using these broad dates, but of course we need some kind of framework. Now what were these folk sports as such? Well, this is what football looked like, if you look, in 18th century Britain, folk or mob, mob football. Now, I've watched a few football matches today that look like that, and I'm sure you've seen that on the playing fields of Kingswood College. But these were games that were traditional just for that particular town or, 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 or location. Perhaps they didn't have many rules. You've heard of the famous kind of Shrove Tuesday game, which involves chasing a ball from one end of the town to the other with literally anything goes. The unlimited number on each side, there are no rules or regulations, there's certainly not a referee. Why is that the case? Because society also reflected that. People lived in country districts, there wasn't much sharing of information. So you couldn't take your ball and then go and play in a neighbouring town because their rules were completely different. So now fast forward to modern society and we have this form of football. A man who's back in the news, of course, Cristiano Ronaldo. I would like what he earns just for one week. He's just re-signed for Manchester United. Do you know how much he earns? <laughs> Too much is the answer. His weekly wage is £480,000. He earns, earns half a million pounds a week, basically, ladies and gentlemen. How about that? Because why? Because society deems that sports stars are superstars. They should be paid or can be paid accordingly. Now that is how society deems someone like Ronaldo. He is someone that the, the, the youngsters look up to. But what about how the game is played? It's, a, it's, a, it's still a sport. It has rules and regulations. But because our society has so many rules and regulations, something like football has changed over that, over that time. And we'll come back to Ronaldo later on in my talk. So after, um, after the, the folk period, something happened within British society. And I'm, I'm referring to Britain, not because I'm a Brit or in um, Grahamstown. I'm referring to it because the British, I'm afraid, did invent modern sport. The sports we play today came from the public schools, the private schools, like Kingswood College, of Britain, and I'll explain why. But there was a shift in that important few decades in the 1800s. First of all, the British Empire took off. We know that Britain during that century was the most powerful empire the world had ever seen. And the British were very keen to spread their values around the world and they used sport to do so. The other thing that was important was the Industrial Revolution in Britain. Because now people weren't living out in the country districts, they were now working in close proximity. Now, if you were a factory owner, why do you think you would encourage your workers to play sport? Well, it kept them on the straight and narrow. It also kept them healthy. And it meant you could manage smaller areas. And this is when, during this period, we have our sports grounds, our recreation grounds, and our clubs that are founded. Okay? But the most important thing is that sport was linked to education. Even here today, as we stand, I can see the guys out there kicking a football round and they're encouraged to do so or throwing a rugby ball because it was seen as virtuous. This idea that people should spend their time doing something that was productive and sport was important because, as I'll show you before, other things not so productive were quite common in British society. So if Britain was going to be a world leader, the way people spent their leisure time, for the first time they actually had leisure time, they weren't working the fields from dawn to dusk, they had set hours, they actually had a half day off on a Saturday. And why do we play sport on a Saturday afternoon? Because of the, these times. By the way, we play sport on a Sunday now, don't we? And that's something that's changed because you've never played um, sport on the Sabbath during the 19th century. 
And then, how did sp this form of sport arrive here in South Africa? Well, it was all to do with this um, spread of the British Empire. And that generally came in the later part of the 1900s, because that's when this influence started to reach places, as I said, in South Africa. Now, we've got rugby fans in the, in the, in the room, I'm sure, and it's one of my favourite quotes. You've probably heard that. That rugby is a hooligans game played by gentlemen, according to Winston Churchill. You know what they say about soccer, don't you? It's a gentleman's game played by hooligans. But it was this idea that now sports contain some kind of virtuous behavior. It could instill, instill lessons, even games like rugby. Okay? Now, I am a football player and a soccer fan, but I have to put this in because I thought it was quite good. And there's Ronaldo again. Football is 90 minutes pretending you're hurt. Rugby is 90 min uh, 80 minutes pretending you're not. But this ethos of the different sports, of course, was also spread or instilled during the 1800s in schools like Kingswood. That's why rugby was encouraged, because it was this hooligans game played by gentlemen. It taught you to respect the opposition, respect the referee. You, what you did on the field was left and you came off. You were now a gentleman and you played in a certain way. And that's something that I find interesting when I look at certain sports. So we know here at Kingswood that rugby and, and cricket and netball and hockey are encouraged, like they are in most educational institutions, because of these lessons that were learnt from the Victorians in the 1800s. So it's what they call, ladies and gentlemen, rational recreation. Again, another academic term from, from the historians, but the, the idea that how we spend our leisure time should be rational. So instead of killing each other, taking money off of each other, abusing our bodies, we are doing something that's virtuous, and that's what sport is all about. Now here we have Benny and Stanley Osler, who are who were ex-Kingswoodian um, scholars, of course, and they went on to play for the Springboks. So sport also gave us pride. Now, when I was researching the history of this wonderful college, of course, sport plays a big part. So ex-old boys and girls who've gone on to do great things. By the way, Stanley Osler, he went on to be the principal of Kersney College down there in Durban. So again, you've got this idea that sport and education is linked. It was never going to be in conflict. So why do we play sports such as rugby, soccer, cricket in countries like South Africa today? So when and how did they arrive? Now I'm sure we've got a lot of scholars in the room that you know the history of some of this, but I'm just going to touch on it. Because it was in the mid-late 1800s when cricket certainly became cemented here in South Africa. In fact, the first record of a cricket match being played was earlier than that. It was in 1802 down at uh, the Cape Town Castle when the British garrison pitched stumps. And it's a famous, uh, famous newsletter where they, where they invite the locals to play the British garrison. But rugby was introduced later. And you probably heard of this man, Canon George Ogilvie. He was actually um, at the Diocesan College, which we know as bishops in Cape Town. And you know what they say about bishops. How do you know anybody who went to bishops? They'll tell you. And they've got this proud, they've got this proud history, of course, of sport. And one of the proudest things is Canon George Ogilvie actually brought rugby, the rugby that we play today, into South Africa. But if you look, where did he come from? He came from Winchester College, which was a private school in the UK, in England. So these clergymen, these teachers, and these soldiers were bringing sport around the world, places like South Africa, and this is how it was instilled. So if your learned men, if the people you respect in society are, are encouraging to, you to do something, you tend to follow it, and that's exactly what happened. The other thing was the early tours of empire. Now, if anybody has read my book, Empire, War and Cricket, you know the cricket tours were very significant at that time. But what they did is they bound this idea of empire together. If you played together, you did business together. Or more importantly, you fought and died together. So now you are part of this brotherhood, as I call it, in terms of empire. You've seen that map before, I'm sure. The, the, the country's painted in red a part of the British Empire in the 1890s. And as you can see, South Africa was part of that club. Over a third of the world was controlled by the British. Over a third of the world was now speaking English and, and being encouraged to incul inculcate and adopt British ways of life. Not just sport and culture, but also things like religion and language. 
That's why we are in a, in a beautiful building like this and I'm presenting in English. It was because this empire was so successful in instilling its values and sport was spread around the world. So if people ask me, well, why are the, why are the New Zealanders so good at rugby? Why did the Indians play cricket? It's because they were part of the British Empire and those sports were taken there with a purpose. And some sports were taken up more than others for various reasons. So I haven't got time to go in today, but I've actually designed university courses that look at this idea of sport and empire. And each case has very intricate reasons, but broadly speaking, the British transferred sport with a purpose and a reason. And this is where I get the title, how sport shaped the world. It's what we've got in common. It's why we play cricket against Pakistan. It's why we play, play rugby. I won't mention against the Wallabies this weekend. But we do, we play rugby against Australia because we've got that in common. It's the British Empire and it's that link. So the factors influencing sport, well, the number one is the public elite schools, okay? These public schools in the United Kingdom in the mid 1800s, and by the way, I've got to make the point now, this was a men, o a men only club. I'm sorry, ladies, you were not encouraged to go to these schools. This was games for the boys at this stage but they bought into this idea of athleticism, this idea that you had a healthy body, a healthy mind, the Olympic ideal. Where did that come from? Well, we can trace its origins right back to the Greek civilization. Also, this idea of muscular Christianity. Clergymen would actually encourage the young men to go out and play sport. So to be a good Christian, you're also a physical Christian. You're also a sporting and a healthy Christian. And then we had the codification. And if you look, the codification where rules were given and governing bodies were formed, roughly were formed in the same kind of decade. The Football, Associ Football Association in 1863, the Rugby Football Union in 1871, the Lawn Tennis Association. Because now, schools like Kingswood wanted to play schools like St Andrews. And if they were going to play a common game, they had to play the same rules. So therefore, you needed a governing body. And if you wanted, if Graham Stein wanted to go down and play Port Alfred in a competition, they had to agree to the same rules. So it was no good now having your localised folk games. And this is how society was changing. We had these governing bodies, something like the Football Association. And we're so used to now names like the IOC, the Olympic um, um, Committee. We're used to the uh, FIFA and these governing bodies. This is where they started, which is interesting. But the good old Victorians, and I love the Victorians, my book is all about the Victorians, they were into, into discipline, they, they lived a, a certain way. Maybe they were certainly hypocrites, but they recognised that sport would encourage moral training. This idea of leadership, so to be a captain on the rugby pitch, you are going to be a good leader of men, you're going to be a captain of society and maybe industry. I've mentioned rational recreation, well the Victorians didn't want people in the Dare I say, the pubs and the brothels of a weekend, so therefore they wanted their, their, their men, their workers, their leaders playing sport. But they didn't like people getting paid to play sport. Now this is where this incredible contradiction comes up. Today, I've already mentioned how much Ronaldo gets paid. Nearly half a million pounds a week, isn't it obscene just to say it? Well, the Victorians would have looked down on Ronaldo because they said you played fun for the love of the game and for what it did, not for extrinsic or financial benefits. Again, it's a link to society. What is one of the things that we hold highest in society today? Well, this idea of capitalism, this idea of wealth, of material things. Therefore, people like Ronaldo are held up on a, on a pedestal because what they can earn through their skill and expertise. Again, it's a link to society. So I'm talking about where we've come from, but even in the 1890s, somewhere like London was still a hotbed, perhaps, of, can we say, animal sports, gambling, gin palaces, etc. All of a sudden, those in authority, the government, started to introduce things like museums, exhibitions, parks. They were very keen on sports clubs because it meant that society went from this kind of activity of a weekend, bear baiting, would you believe, Let's go down and watch some bear get ripped apart by a pack of dogs. I mean, it's incredible. But that's how society was, because it was quite bloodthirsty and you didn't have the rules and regulations. All of a sudden, the Victorians now were encouraging this kind of, this kind of activity. You know, these wonderful old gentlemen with the big moustaches. These are early football team, the Corinthians, that came down to South Africa in 1903. 
It wasn't just about beating the locals, it was about spreading the virtues of sport. So they played in a certain way, and it was all about how they socialised. So they toured South Africa with a specific reason, and that's what I'm really interested in, this idea of cultural imperialism. You spread your culture through this idea of promoting it. I often say to my students, and you'll appreciate this as teachers, now, if you're going to give them an, ass an assignment to do, if you tell them to do that homework, they'll do it, but they'll do it reluctantly. But if we said, listen, we're all going to do this together, it'll be for the good of you and it'll be enjoyable. They'll still do the assignment, but I'm sure you'll agree they'll do it with more spirit and perhaps they'll see the benefit. That's what the British did. They allowed you to sort of enter into their world at a very much a, a persuasive, in a persuasive way. A bit different from the Americans, as you can probably uh, um, notice. I mean, when the Americans go into a country, they tend to go in with force, and their legacy is not often there over the longer term. If the British go in and encourage you to play cricket in a place like India, that's perhaps why we're still playing, or they're still playing cricket in India today, because this legacy lives on. Now, this is a wonderful picture of Wimbledon Common. Now, I haven't mentioned the ladies yet. Well, the ladies, of course, were just as important in, that, in Victorian society, but it was a man's world, it was a patriarchal world. Again, it reflected society. None of this equality then, of course the ladies ruled the roost in reality, but they were allowed or deemed acceptable to have certain pursuits. Of course they were physical, they enjoyed competition. Archery was quite popular, and if you look close, I mean, look how they're dressed. This was an early dating agency. You went along and met people of your own social class. And if you look at that man at the back, I think he's there, he's probably eyeing up his next wife or whatever. And of course they didn't sweat or perspire, you mustn't do that as a lady in the Victorian times. I mean, it's so different from today. I mean, look at these scenes of tennis, lawn tennis. I mean, incredible how they're wear, what they're wearing. Now, we're going to mention tennis, how about this for a message? And I've got to put this in because if anybody watched what happened over this weekend, an incredible message. And I had to speak to the students about this. We have a 19-year-old and an 18-year-old, two young ladies that came from nowhere to compete in the final of the USO Flushing Meadow this weekend. Leila Fernandez on the left from a very poor background. Her mum was a, a, domestic, a Filipino who worked for two years and left the family. And now look at her, she's in the final. But the girl on the right in the red, that's Emma... Emma Redacano, and Emma is a British champion, the first for, I don't know, in my lifetime I, I can remember. But her background is quite interesting. She's from um, a Romanian father, Chinese mother, that she was born in Canada and moved to the United Kingdom. Of course, now she's a champion of the British. But the point I wanted to make to the kids this morning is those two young ladies have overcome the hardships of COVID in the last two years to rise to the height of their sport and the kind of mental strength they've shown to do that, and also the vulnerability that they've shown as well. Emma Radakanu got to the quarterfinals of Wimbledon but pulled out because of the pressure, and she was heavily criticised. Look at her now. She's just won two and a half million at the US Open. An incredible story. So society now offers young ladies equal opportunity in prize money and in competition because now we're all about equality. Thankfully, well, certain societies are, of course. We're not talking about Afghanistan. We're talking about the United States or Great Britain. And that's another thing. But I wanted to put that picture up because it's relevant today. This is Dick Kerr's ladies. Now, Dick Kerr's ladies were a football team. They were quite famous because you give uh, ladies an opportunity and they're going to prove they're as good as men. Of course they are. But men controlled sport. So when, you probably know, when were ladies given an opportunity to prove their worth? During the First and the Second World War, because men were off fighting and the country had to still run. So ladies went into the factories, into the fields, and they did a bloody good job at it as well, and they proved themselves. In the Second World War, women's football became popular because these ladies were a factory. This was a munitions factory up in Preston, and Dick Kerr's ladies became famous. Do you know this team once played to 35,000 people at Goodison Park just after the Second World War? There was a problem now for the men returning from the war, certainly for the Football Association. Do you know what the Football Association did next? They banned women's football in the United Kingdom until 1971. That's why we don't consider women's football of an equal standard, because men was controlling it and they felt threatened. 
So there are so many interesting instances. So if people ask me, Dean, why is sport so important? Sport is significant of what was happening in wider society. The Dick Kerr's Ladies, there's a tremendous book that's been written about them. I encourage you to, to have a look at that. W.G. Grace, here he is, my old friend. Well, he was everywhere now in the Victorian day. He was the, uh, he was the superstar of the Victorians. He personified the hypocrisy of the Victorians. You know, he was uh, obviously a famous cricketer, but he was also a GP, a medical man but he was a bit of an imposter. He earned so much out of cricket that he paid somebody to run his practice back in Gloucestershire. But he never once, never once admitted his earnings because cricket was not about that. It was all about fair play and the gentleman's game. And W.G. Grace personified the Victorian sport, which was cricket. It taught manners, of course. We know that today. Cricket is played in a certain way, unless you're Australian, but they play it in a different way anyway, don't they? It instilled sportsmanship, the respect for each other, to win and lose in the same gracious way. It was amateur-led. That's the important thing. But W.G. Grace and my man, James Logan, who I'm going to talk about now, they were just incredible hypocrites because they made money out of sport. At least Cristiano Ronaldo is open about it. He, he's a very wealthy man through sport. The Victorians were just as, as obsessed with, with, uh, with making money. But it also compounded the class structure. It's one of the reasons I quite enjoy life in South Africa, more so perhaps in Britain, because there's still that defined class structure in Britain. It's invisible. You know, to come to a school like Kingswood in the United Kingdom, you have to be quite rich, but you have to come from a certain background. And cricket and sport, the sports you choose, compound that class definition. So that's why rugby and cricket is, are deemed as middle upper class. A game like football, well, that's the working man's game. So even the sports that you play also shows your status in society, certainly in a place like the United Kingdom. Cricket also bound the empire. This man is back in the news, of course, Cecil John Rhodes. He also understood the power of cricket. Now, Cecil John Rhodes on the left as a schoolboy, that's him in his native Bishop Stortford in the school team, a bit of a sickly youngster, apparently. But when he came to South Africa and he became premier of the Cape Colony, he was very interested in promoting cricket here for the reasons I've already mentioned. And in fact, he put the money up for the 1894 cricket tour back to the old country, the very first cricket team that went back to England. And it was the only time that he fell out with his old mate, this man, James Logan. Now, you remember this man? I've put this man's name in, up in lights because he's the central character of my book, Empire, War and Cricket. He's the man that built Mikey's Fontaine. Now, he was a bit of a, a rascal. He cut corners, he would dodgy deals, you know, shady politics, but he promoted cricket in this country. And along with Cecil Rhodes, he realized that cricket was the empire game. And eventually, he, his great ambition was to control the game in South Africa, which he did during the 1890s. And along with Cecil Rhodes, they were instrumental in bringing international sport here. But people often say, why the 1890s? Well, you, the English cricket teams were touring North America, Australia, long before they came to South Africa. Why do you think they were suddenly keen to come to South Africa in the 1890s? Gold had been discovered. Money. So if you want to now deal with the country, you start to impose, or not impose, persuade people to play your games. And all of a sudden, we're all playing cricket and everything's jolly good. Well, Logan is famous, of course, for building Mikey's Fontaine. And if you look closer, ladies and gentlemen, along his high street, there's a cricket net there. Because Logan, he enjoyed the game of cricket, but he understood the power of it in terms of its political impact. Here, here he is, a rich man, at the height of his fame in the 1890s, playing a game of cricket on his own high street. When I looked at the scorecards, of course, Logan enjoyed playing a game, and he always seemed to get double figures against the English touring teams that came and played against him at Mikey's Fontaine. And somebody once explained, well, you know what happened? He would come out, and uh, if, the, if the fast bowler took his middle wicket too early, he'd just stand there and put the stump back in the ground and carry on and get 10 or 12. Well, it was his hometown, wasn't it? This is how the game was played. You see, it was all about status and about the socialization of the game. For those of you who have ever come to my talk about Empire One Cricket, you will remember the wonderful story of how James Logan actually sponsored the 1891 English team to come to South Africa. Sponsored. He put the money up for them. I've seen the letters between him and the English cricket captain, the chap on the right, Walter Reed. 
Walter Reed and Logan agreed that they would share in the profits. But unfortunately for these guys, they didn't make the money that the first tour had made, Major Wharton's tour of 1888. The English thought they were going to slip away without paying back their debt. Oh no, they didn't. Our Scotsman has the English cricket team arrested as they board the ship at Cape Town Harbour. Can you imagine when I tell that story in Scotland? A Scotsman arresting the English cricket team. They think it's fantastic. Get in. He became a star of the media. And media is important, of course, because media is so important for sport. London County versus Logan's team in 1901. Do you know that James Logan, what a chancer. He takes his own South African cricket team back to England while the South African war is being fought. The South African war, he's featured. And there, London County, there's WG Grace. This is his professional team where he makes money. They're all helping each other. It's not what you know, it's who you know. Nothing has changed. Politics rears its head. These two chaps, John X. Merriman on the left and James Sivright, well, they were part of Cecil Rhodes' first ministry, and you'll probably remember the story if you read the book. James Sivright on the, on the right, James Logan's big mate, he was the guy that gave away the government contracts. James Logan was a railwayman who made money out of the refreshment facilities. Well, his mate on the right in the government gave him the monopoly of all the refreshment facilities on the railway for 18 years without putting it out to tender. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound familiar? But do you know how James Logan could get away with it? He was a cricket man. He was a gentleman. He was a sportsman. He used sport as a smokescreen. Think about comparisons today. I don't know, someone like Roman Abramovich, owner of Chelsea. We don't know how he made his money. We don't care because he's a good old football man. You see, sport cures all evils. That's something we can see about society today. So to go back to my final point here, I want to look at war and empire and the fact that colonial loyalty came into this. These wonderful old, um, car um, not cartoons, these, these posters actually relate sport to this idea of, of, of honour and patriotism. If you can see the greater game, that is Mr. Punch there in 1914 saying to a professional soccer player, you can, no doubt you get glory on this field, my man, but you can get honour in another field, and you know where that was, on the fields of, Fla of France and the Somme. But the rugby boys, they'd already signed up because rugby was a middle upper class game. They did not play sport while war was being fought, but the soccer players did because soccer was always a game of the working class. As beautiful as that game is, it was taken on by people because it, in many respects it's less complex. So it spread around the world as a working man's game as opposed to the cricket and rugby um, characteristics of the other two sports. So you can see there's a constant link to society which reflects what is going on in that society. If you could play that for me, please. Thank you. The Empire Games opens with pomp, ceremony, colour and cheering. First a procession of the competitors. Britons from all over the world assembled to compete for nothing more than honour and glory. The oath was taken. We, all loyal subjects of His Majesty, will take part in the games in the true spirit of sportsmanship. In the place of the symbol of peace, the dove, 40,000 pigeons are released. A happy omen. After the opening ceremonies, the various contingents march off and the games begin. The 100 yards final. Miss Hiscock, England, wins easily from Miss Strike of Canada in 11 and 3 tenths seconds. The half mile, which was an outstanding event. Today, no record was broken, but Edwards' win by eight yards made it a great and unforgettable race. At the bell, the British Guiana representative was leading by about 10 yards, and all Stothards, Bothers and Powell's efforts to overhaul him were of no avail. 
In the meantime, the field events were being desperately fought out. As expected, Finlay, the English hurdler, proved himself unbeatable at 120 yards. An unfortunate accident befell Fieljum, the South African, who crashed at the eighth hurdle and dislocated his shoulder, throwing Gabriel right out of his stride and virtually out of the race. And here we are at the new Empire Swimming Pool, Wembley, just in time to see the start of the 1500 yards men's freestyle final. Larson Canada's not swimming. Ryan, Australia brings the crowd to their feet with a wonderful burst and wins by three yards. The 100 yards ladies backstroke final. Miss Harding, England, goes straight away to the front. She wins comfortably from Miss Hamilton, Scotland, in the good time of 13 and 4 fifths seconds. Here's some real high diving. The best of a good bunch was Mather, who just won from the Englishman Tomlin with Marchant, also of the home country, third. Wonderful scenes, wonderful scenes there you can say. That was actually the first Empire Games. The Empire Games became the Commonwealth Games. If you want evidence of how sport actually defined um, the Empire, it's, it's actually the, the existence of that game. So we know South Africa are part of the Commonwealth still, or certainly in terms of sport. But somebody else had other ideas. We talk about we had the, the so-called Nazi Olympics, but the Berlin Olympics, and we know how Adolf Hitler actually got hold of the Olympics as a propaganda tool. He promoted his regime, he promoted how efficient Germany were, and a lot of the countries there, of course, didn't realise the horrors of what was coming next. I want to just jump on to the Olympic goal. I think the Olympics are so important. If you look, if we've just had, if we just had uh, the, the Nazi Olympics in 1936, the Olympic girl says that it should place sport everywhere at the, at the and with a view to encouraging the establishment of a peaceful society concerned with the preservation of human dignity. Not once have they mentioned winning or success in any way. It's all to do with the preservation of society, dignity, how we treat each other. And that's what the Olympics are still about today. And do you know that even today, the athletes take the Olympic oath? You see, where did the Olympics come from? We know now that it came from the ancient Greeks. The ancient Greeks, of course, were very much, <laughs> certainly in terms of sport, different. Uh, one thing I hope you will notice is they didn't wear clothes. It was a men-only naked event. But you'll certainly see here that certain, um, certain traditions were taken on. So we can see the Olympic flame that we actually use still today. I mean, the wonderful muscular bodies of these men, it's something that we still um, revere today. You know, this idea of muscular Christianity to be a healthy human and this athletic body that, that a lot of people still strive for. But as you can see, it was very much um, without clothes, as it were. What's happened to my... Here we have a pentathlete. I mean, a lot of these images, of course, come from, come, come from drawings, etc. But the Olympics are something that we still do today, but at a, certainly at a different level. Tokyo is an interesting um, case, of course. Just look at this, how they promoted this year's Olympics. Everything comes down to this moment. Well, it's a great day, George, with the arrival of the Olympic plate at the end of its 2,000 mile journey from
The Olympics reflect sport and society today, a multi-billion dollar industry, of course. And I think you can probably notice there, there was a lot more emphasis on being successful and winning. But at the bottom of it, it's still this idea of taking part and playing in a certain way. And we don't often talk about the earnings of the, of the athletes, do we? We're not really how, sure how much they earn because that is not the Olympic ideal. They're there for a certain reason and it comes from the Victorian age, as I've said. And it, that last point I want to make, professionalism and sport business, money. Now we, I'm sure you'll agree, we're, we live in a capitalist society where money is certainly one of our gods. And the business of sport is why we, at university, we encourage students to come and study sport management and business and those kind of things. If we look at our friend Ronaldo, we know he's a, a, a billion dollar ticket. He's a walking billboard for the advertisers because advertising and sponsorship is also part of the modern world. Um, I was having a discussion with a friend recently of how DSTV now want you to subscribe or at least to share your subscription because they get more money from advertising than they do from the actual money we pay for subscription. So this idea that DSTV is there to entertain us, well, it's obviously there to, for us to look at advertising. And what's the main reason we all subscribe to DSTV? The sport. Sport is so important in society in terms of entertainment. The commercial revolution in sport was really during the 1990s. It was this idea that you had this TV, the media, sport, and sponsorship. And it was this kind of triangular relationship that drove sport to its new levels. It's the reason why we can pay someone like Cristiano Ronaldo almost half a million pounds a week. It's incredible. But that kind of money is within the game because of this relationship. And we know that higher sponsorships and satellite coverage means that we can watch sport from the, from the comfort of our own home. We don't physically have to go to those stadiums. I mean, the days of the Empire Games and that wonderful old commentary, I mean, it's laughable now, isn't it? But the standard of sport has gone so much higher. And let's think how we can compare that. Perhaps that's desperation in many respects, a bit like the Roman Empire. They want to make things more entertaining. They'll change the rules to adapt to the spectator, not to the participant. Well, we know it's, uh, in the, it's, a, it's a good old saying, but I quite agree with it. In the olden days, fame used to be created by doing something, good or bad. You know, Hitler was famous. But now, sport is certainly a way of creating some kind of fame. And we have this celebrity culture everywhere. James Logan bought into it. He would invite famous sportsmen to Mikey's Fontaine, so it's nothing new. But now, celebrity culture is part of our society, so it's part of sport. So it goes beyond the public, the, the public, their public persona goes beyond the sports field. We know that. Does anybody know who that is? Probably one of the most famous footballers of his generation in Britain. That's Sir Stanley Matthews. I mean, look at him. He looks like an old man there, doesn't he? Well, that was a 1950s footballer. This is a modern footballer. A great soccer player, don't get me wrong, but David Beckham's more famous for, the, for his brand marketing and his business acumen. And it's all about this celebrity culture, you see. Another famous person, certainly here in South Africa, is Casta Semenya. The media portray people in a certain way. We know the issues around Casta Semenya, but just have a, have a look how she's portrayed in the media here in South Africa. Because people are uncomfortable with that, the gender roles within sport. Sport is seen as still as a quite a traditional thing here. I remember when I moved from the UK, it was quite unusual to see a women's rugby team, for example, 20 years ago. That, thankfully, has changed because our gender roles and equality has started to come through. But we still get these images, don't we? The men are on the front cover of Sport Illustrated, brute force, look how the women are portrayed. Now that is becoming less and less because sport is reflecting society and the equality within society. And I think these are important lessons for our young people to learn. If I had more time, we could, we could do this in one of the classes. National identity, well, I'm just going to quickly go through this because national identity is an important thing as well about creating a, a nation or a society. I mean, South Africa didn't exist. 150 years ago, but now we know about South Africa as a country because we play the same sports, we wear the springbok. It is part of creating this idea of a community, this imagined community that comes through on the sports field. What about these countries, the smaller countries, places like Scotland and Wales? Well, I love Scottish and Welsh people, but they're very patriotic. 
This quote is one of my favourites. In 1977, the Welsh captain, Phil Bennett, said, Boys, these English you're just going out to meet have taken our coal. They've taken our water. They've, they, they've taken our steel. They buy our houses and live in them a fortnight a year. Down the centuries, boys, these English have exploited and pillaged us, and we're playing them this afternoon, boys. It's all about the identity. And that's the Scots and the Welsh for you. They've got this identity through sport, and we can see that. It's this idea of a nationalism that comes through sport. We can see the edges. People would... You'd think I was crazy if I walked down here with my pe face painted in a, in, a, in a South African flag singing the anthem. But if I did that on a Saturday supporting the box, you'd let it go because it's part of national identity. Sport is so important when it comes to that. It can also seal divisions within a nation, heal divisions. 2019, we had Sia Khaleesi lift the Webb Ellis Trophy, the first African captain of the Springboks. Not only that, a successful captain. What did that do for racial harmony within this country? Well, more than the politicians could ever hope to do. And that kind of sentiment, of course, goes back to other things. But I think there was someone behind that, by the way, when you look at politics. Um, I saw this online, I just had to share with you. Isn't that just magnificent? Let's make the Springboks great again. And that's what he did in 2019. Well, not him, Razi Erasmus did that, of course. But it goes back to 1906. 1906, the first ever Springboks. Do you know that the first ever Springboks that went to the UK contained players that had fought against each other in the Anglo-Boer War just four years before? They'd have shot each other. Now they're playing in the same scrum. That is why I study sports history in this country, because of magnificent stories like that. That will be a book in the future from me, so please don't steal that idea, will you? And then what happened in 2010? You talk about uniting a nation. Well, this lady came down. She said, it's time for Africa. We had the 2010 FIFA World Cup. It brought the country together. We're going to skip that. Just a little bit, one minute. Okay, that, I don't want to show you Sha Sha Shakira, sir, because it might put you off my talk. She's quite a nice looking lady. But 2010 was so important because it brought this country together. We actually achieved something remarkable. We held a, a mega event and we did it very well. And in fact, it was one of the things I came back down to South Africa to do, to do the research, to understand the social significance of the 2010 FIFA World Cup. And that old man certainly knew the power of sport, didn't he? He certainly knew what that would do for this country. What a wonderful quote that is. Whatever the result of the match tonight, one thing is for sure, England have never played in a more beautiful setting. They built that, that stadium, of course, for billions of rand. Um, Set Blatter, who controlled FIFA, wanted that stadium built. But we know that it put South Africa back on the map. People are now visiting us a decade later because of what they saw during the World Cup. But it did cost us a lot of money, but that's another talk. I'll, uh, lend, I'll let you know the secrets about that as we go on. But our background is troubled. Frank Braun, who was the president of the South African National Olympic Committee, said this in the 80s. There was a racial element to South Africa at that time. I'm not going to go into apartheid now. We haven't got the time and certainly haven't got the emotion tonight. But we do know that sport is built upon race here in South Africa, as it is elsewhere. And that is one of the things I will always say, that South Africa during the 50s and 60s, it remained the last bastion of officially sanctioned racism. It meant the sport was also played along that way. In 1958, the South African Sports Association was formed. It was a non-racial sports association. But eventually, sport started to change society here. You remember the slogan, no normal sport in an abnormal society? The boycott movement. How did people start to change the way they thought? Well, as South Africans, we love our sport. And the one thing you'll do, you will hurt us if we remove competition. So that's what the boycott movement decided to do, the rest of the world. But... The rest of the world were also racist, let's make, make that clear. But here in South Africa, we had apartheid. And then, of course, we had this idea of civil disobedience that changed everything. But we know, if you look at the records of a wonderful place like Makanda, all people of all colours and backgrounds were playing sport from the start. Even during those early days of cricket down in Cape Town, the first coloured cricket clubs were formed. In fact, some of the first sports clubs here in the Eastern Cape are African sports clubs. 
So now we are starting to rewrite our history books, the rich history of non-white sport in South Africa. So thankfully, the, the uh, records are opening up. But as I mentioned, we're not the only country with this problem of racism that still exists. We can see it every weekend, certainly in international soccer. There's always incidents. I believe here in South Africa, we are dealing with this awful, awful phenomenon that we call racism. Probably as, <laughs> as well as anybody else, at least we talk about it. You remember 1981, the New Zealand tour going over there, the flower bomb and, and things like that? I had the privilege of meeting the captain of that tour, Vinan Klaassen. And there's a man who understood the context in which it was operating at the time and the incredible dynamic. But these kind of incidents made people aware that politics and sports were not separate. But also in 1981, we had this man. Did you know a guy called Errol Tobias was the first uh, non-white player to represent the Springboks when he played in a test at Newlands? Not that well known. We all since tend to think of Chester Williams, but Errol Tobias was the man. And then what happened? In 1990, F.W. de Klerk decided, or certainly in negotiations with the ANC, the new South Africa was going to be founded on sport. In 92, what did the Olympic Committee do? They decided to invite South Africa back to the Barcelona Games. So there we are. The approval is through sport. That's how important it is within society. And in 95, that happened. They've even made a film about it in Hollywood, Invictus. Morgan Freeman and Matt Damon playing those wonderful characters. You know what that means, that image. If there's one image that shows you the importance of sport, it's when that man put on a Springbok jersey and handed the Webb Ellis Trophy to Francois Pinar. Pinar knows what it was all about. Looking back, 95 became a story about us, the new South Africa finding identity. I had the privilege of interviewing him last year. Incredible honour. He's a very humble man, he under, but he understands what that meant at that moment. And what is the future of our wonderful country? Well, they've called us the Rainbow Nation for, for a long time. We know the elections were a long time ago, but sport continues to build our country. Nelson Mandela, he's still there. He's still overlooking us because of the principles in which he instilled. And many of those principles were through sport. We know the flag and the anthem were changed. They are symbols of sport. How can we create a new South Africa if we bring the old symbols with us? So you watch the game on Saturday against the Wallabies. Men standing there proudly, a country standing proudly with a new anthem and a new flag. The ANC embraces the Springbok perhaps as a new symbol. Well, there's been a lot of question of that Springbok being removed, but it's still there and it shows reconciliation, the fact that it's still there. And it's all about nationalizing the population. Look at those images from 2010. For that month, I don't know if you enjoyed any of the games, but I certainly were, I traveled around the country. Images like that, people who'd never met each other. Sport did something special. Unfortunately, it didn't last for long, the party. They all went back into their own areas, but that's natural. But for one month, it showed you the power of sport. The present, well, we have a South, an African, a black springbok captain. Women's rugby is now played openly in South Africa. Perhaps gender equality has reached us at last. Society is changing, therefore sport is changing. And I want to end with this, ladies and gentlemen. As I said, this man, I think he inspires a lot of us. He's, he's, he's a controversial figure, figure, don't get me wrong. To a lot of people, he represents something else. But one thing he did understand was the power of sport. And you've read that quote many a time because Nelson Mandela understood the power of sport and, and perhaps its role in society. This, I hope you've enjoyed this uh, very, very brief synopsis of a course that I've got online. If you'd like to learn more about it, please get in touch, how sports shape the world. As I said, I've tried to put in the best part of an hour there, what's take, what takes me months as part of a university course, and it was a really difficult thing to do. So we've got a course, we've got a, 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 a thing about it. Or the other thing I'd like you to, to just mention is, each week we produce a, a newsletter called This Week in History. And um, every day there's been an event, of course, in history, and we have a lot of sport recorded within that. It's a free newsletter. Please join. 
and, uh, and have a look at that. What's happened this week in history? Uh, well, this week in history in uh, 1888, it was the first ever international beauty pageant. In 1683, bacteria was first um, recognized. And in 2017, to go back to sport, the Springboks suffered their biggest ever defeat at the hands of the All Blacks, 57 nil. But we won't talk about that. Some things are best left forgotten. But I want to leave you on a, on a, a really positive note. And we'll go back to a non-sporting man here, the great Anthony Hopkins. Because we're all going through a tricky time at the moment, but I saw this quote the other day, and I want to just end with this. Anthony Hopkins said, None of us are getting out of here alive, so please stop treating yourself like an afterthought. Eat the delicious food, walk in the sunshine, jump in the ocean, say the truth that you're carrying in your heart like hidden treasure. Be silly, be kind, be weird. There's no time for anything else. So stay safe, ladies and gentlemen, but let's keep living because that's what it's all about. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Uh, just very quickly from me, a great thank you for, 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 to Dean for, for your time. We, we look forward to welcoming him back on campus at the end of October. He's um, presenting a keynote speech at our TEACH conference um, on sports and transformation. So a different angle to history, sport, and the impact that it makes. Um, we can't say goodbye without saying a huge thank you to those people behind the scenes, our AB team, and the chapel stewards who have been keeping this going both online as well as in the chapel. Dean's going to be around for a bit if you, you want to have a chat. Um, but thank you for joining us both online and here in person.